Okay, good evening. Welcome. I am Jessica Berg. I'm the interim dean here at the law school, and I'd like to welcome you to our Batisti lecture this evening. The Frank J. Batisti lecture honors the late chief judge of the US District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Judge Batisti was the youngest federal judge in the nation when he was appointed by President Kennedy in 1961. During his 33 years on the bench, he heard an extraordinary number of important cases notably the Cleveland desegregation case for schools and a housing discrimination case involving the city of Parma. Judge Battisti had a close relationship with Case Western Reserve School of Law. Many of his clerks were graduates of our school and one of our former professors, Ted Mearns, served as a special expert in the Cleveland school case. After Judge Battisti's untimely death in 1994, Many of his former clerks and others who held him in great esteem endowed this lecture series in his memory. The speakers in this series have reflected Judge Battisti's extraordinary range of interests in law, religion, philosophy, and even fishing. <laughs> that is not my understanding of tonight's program, I think. <laughs> Before we get to tonight's program, I want to recognize some members of Judge Battisti's family, including his niece, Linda Battisti, and his sister-in-law, retired Judge Diane Karpinski of the Ohio Court of Appeals. If you're here, would you please stand to be recognized? Thank you. Also, if my, I may ask any of the former clerks who are in attendance to stand and be recognized. Thank you all. I'm going to turn it over to our Associate Dean Jonathan Enton, who will give a more specific introduction for the judge. We very much appreciate you coming here and all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Jessica. Jessica has, has been on the road and she's on her way to uh, uh, another program. We've actually, we're in the middle of a two-day conference run by the Law Medicine Center in, in this room, uh, and Jessica is involved with that. Um, tonight's program is very special. Uh, George Shea Stoneham just uh, stood up when uh, Jessica asked about the former clerks. Um, uh, tonight's speaker uh, is one of our most distinguished graduates, as well as one of the, Judge Battisti's former clerks. Uh, Marilyn Shea Stoneham is retiring this year after two decades as a member of the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Ohio, uh, including seven years as Chief Judge? Four. Four. Sorry about it that. Felt like that. Okay. <laughs> sort of like being academic dean. Uh, okay. Um, there are people in the room who will understand that. Um, and during her two decades on the bench, uh, Judge Shea Stoneham has uh, presided over about 90,000 cases. Uh, she began her legal career as one of Judge Battisti's law clerks, uh, then joined. Uh, Jones Day, where she was a partner at the time of her appointment to the bench. She also has served as editor-in-chief of the American Bankruptcy Law Journal, where she implemented some significant changes that, among other things, made it the law journal that courts cite more often than any other law journal, uh, including, by the way, the Harvard Law Review. Um, <laughs> Judge Shea Stoneham has received the Centennial Medal. That is the highest honor that the law school awards. And so we are privileged to welcome her back this evening. Tonight's program is called A Bankruptcy Judge's Exit Interview with the Public. Facilitating the program will be Cheryl Harris, the consumer columnist for The Plain Dealer. Uh, Cheryl Harris is a regular guest on The Sound of Ideas, which is heard on Cleveland Public Radio Station WCPN, and on National Public Radio's Tell Me More, which WCPN broadcasts locally. We're delighted 
to host this latest installment of the Battisti series. We welcome both Cheryl Harris and Judge Shea Stoneham. Uh, you are invited to join us after the program for a reception which will take place right behind us in the lower rotunda. And now let me turn things over to Cheryl Harris and take things away. Thank you. Uh, first of all, can you all hear? Okay, great. So, uh, Marilyn, I just want to start with, you were a law clerk for uh, Judge Battisti. This series is named for him. So I really oh, just cannot hear you. Please. Turn away from the mic. Is it closer to you? Yeah. I can. I asked you earlier. Um, yeah, so, okay, is this better? Is this better? Okay. But you weren't a stop. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, what is it that you learned from Judge Battisti as a law clerk when you were working for him as a law clerk? And what is it that you hope that you're imparting to the law clerks who work with you? Um, and can you hear me? Uh, I learned. Uh, so much about both law and life from Judge Battisti. Uh, he was an incredibly uh, caring man. Um, he, when we take an oath as judges, we uh, say that we will do equal justice to the poor and the rich. He loved that order. Um, that that meant, meant the world to him. Um, and what I learned, among other things, was that I really wanted to be a judge, <laughs> except I didn't want to do criminal law, <laughs> which was kind of a deal breaker most of the time. Uh, but I really, I thought about him a lot today because um, I imagined him as sort of a fly on the wall as President Obama and the Pope were meeting, because they probably were talking a little bit about social justice, one hopes, and he, if I had been a law clerk today, I don't think I, we would have gotten out of his chambers for the first 90 minutes while he speculated about what they would be talking about. He was just a, he was a wonderful conversationalist, but mainly he, he, was, a, he was a very careful jurist. Um, he, he helped me understand that your, your passions um, don't need to be suppressed as a lawyer. Um, they should be followed. And uh, I, hope, I hope that that's what I've been able to impart to my law clerks. I've, I've had wonderful law clerks um, who had a tough job. They had to make me look good, and they did a really good job <laughs> of it. <laughs> uh, so that, that's... I could go on and on, we better, better well, move on. Well, uh, let me just ask you this about uh, just the whole idea of, of your passions and being a judge. So as a, as a lawyer, bankruptcy attorney, or any other kind of attorney, when you walk into a courtroom, you have a paying client, right? You have a, a point of view, and you have a case to make. And when you switch over to being a judge or on the bench, you're supposed to be neutral. So how is it that you go from being an attorney and really being in the muck? And I mean, as an attorney, you even went to Congress to get the law changed on behalf of some clients. So we're talking about a really activist kind of role. And then you switch to the bank, to the judges, to being on the bench. How do you become neutral? How do you, how do you manage that? Well. Um, for the law students in the room, uh, one of the things you should realize is uh, uh, it's axiomatic that you decide the case based upon the record before you. Uh, and so the best piece of it, I mean, when you're, when you're a new judge, sometimes you're just sitting there and you're really antsy because it, it's like, well, I wouldn't have tried it that way. Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? And, and maybe it was because they're being honest and they don't have that part, you know, but, but you just have to rein yourself in and you have to, um, the best advice I got to make the transition was figure out who has the burden of proof, figure out what's in the record with respect to that, figure out whether they've met it, um, and rule, and move on to the next case because there are lots in the in the in the lineup. 
So yeah. maybe go have a drink afterward. <laughs> you don't think that they practiced it right, right? Oh. So. <laughs> Um, Go home and whine to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so you've said that um, no one in bankruptcy, like people don't really know a lot about the bankruptcy experience because nobody brags that they've been there. So um, I wonder if you could just sort of talk about, um, you know, how, how, how much of the community does bankruptcy court touch? Well, um, uh, Jonathan stole the punchline. Um, I recently looked back to see how many cases had come onto my docket during the time I've been a judge, and it's less than 20 years, just a, a tad shy of 20 years. 90,000 cases. And it's only three counties. It, I, I serve Medina, Portage, and Summit counties. Right. Uh, the population of those counties is about 875,000. According to the 2010 census, there were approximately 325,000 households uh, in those three counties. So when you think 90,000 cases, I mean, people move, people, as, the, as we saw in this morning's paper, that there was an update on the census for this year. Um, people are born, people die, people move. So that 875,000 is not a static number, but, um, and a few people file more than once. There are some repeat filers, but Actually, in our, in, in our area, there's not that many. Um, so, and, and husbands and wives can, a husband and wife can file a single case. So, I estimate, and I think very conservatively, that one in five households in those three counties um, has, has had somebody file a case in my court. Uh, then you add to that um, jobs that were either lost or saved uh, in bankruptcy processes, people who've had claims discharged. It's a big ripple. Um, and you're right, people don't talk about it. And that, that's one of the reasons why I was really glad that you and I could have this conversation tonight, because uh, as we'll get into later, I think bankruptcy is often counterintuitive. Um, it, it, it's really not well understood. And, and the people who have, have gone through the process, um, many of them are just mortified by it. I mean, people think that they're, people argue, well, there's no stigma. Well, maybe for a few people, they're not bothered by the stigma. Most people, um, I was, I was getting a massage at a health spa, uh, and I was talking with the woman, 75 minutes, about 60 minutes into it, she said, you know, I filed a, a bankruptcy case. And she'd, she'd owned two spas, her partner had left her with all the debt, um, and I think I was the first person, she'd, she'd moved from Colorado to Arizona, I think I was the first person that she told that she had filed. It's just, um, and she said she said it really did help. I mean, it really did give her a fresh start, but people don't talk about it. I would like, I, it's, in some ways, I would like for people to talk about it more because I think, I think as a society, we would do well to know how many people have gotten themselves into, um, Bad financial positions. Well, and, and one of the reasons people don't talk about it very much is because, um, y you know, there's constantly talk about people abusing the system. And I just wonder, I mean, is there a widespread abuse from where you sit of the bankruptcy system? Um, one, of the, one of the things about bankruptcy is that it, it uh, lends itself to empirical research more than most parts of uh, mm -hmm most disciplines in the law. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Warren, who is now the senior citizen from, uh, senior, senior, senior citizen. citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Can we erase the senior s senator from Massachusetts, um, Teresa Sullivan, who's a sociologist but is now the president of the University of Virginia, and Jay Westbrook uh, began doing uh, work 
looking at the court records starting in the early 80s to figure out who filed and then they they had lots of uh, research assistants and they tracked people down and they did this three different times in the early 80s and the early 90s and in 2000 in early 2000 and what they discovered and it was pretty constant was that for people who filed a consumer bankruptcy one, at least one of three things had happened in 80% of the people of, of that cohort's life. Um, loss of job, end of a marital-like relationship, or catastrophic uninsured medical situation. Um, and I was very grateful uh, for that work because it's so easy for people to uh, characterize with, um, we're not disinclined to kick people when they're down, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I have um, Jim Bickett, who's retiring uh, on Monday. He, he was the US, assistant U.S. attorney who uh, served in, um, in the Northern District of Ohio, uh, appearing on bankruptcy matters. He said, you know, People who come into bankruptcy, they're exhausted, they're terrified, they're traumatized. Um, they're, you know, they're afraid they're going to lose their jobs because they're being garnished so much. Um, they're, uh, and and yes, there, uh, Warren uh, and Westbrook and Sullivan also found that. Um, Somewhere between four and eight percent of the cases had some issues with respect to good faith that would, uh, at the at the worst end, uh, be dishonest. Uh, but those are not. I, I think in, uh, I'm going to ask Marv at some point. Marv Sickerman, who's sitting in the front row, he's been a bankruptcy trustee in in Akron for. Cleveland. I mean, in Cleveland, fifty-three years. 53 years. Um, I think that I, I think that on average in Ohio we have that we we don't rise to the national level in terms of the the lack of good faith. Uh, but you you as a trustee you'd have a better sense of that. <laughs> I would tell you that I would estimate I do approximately seventy cases a month. Okay. Out of the seventy, I might see five that cause my antenna to go up. Out of the five. Two maybe are real questions. Okay. It usually boils down to just one bad apple. Okay. So well, we're that good Midwestern values. We bring those to bankruptcy <laughs> court. We're to Puritan values. We are. We, it, 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 Americans Americans want to pay their debts. Right. They do. They don't for the most part. Right. Broad brush. So you you uh, you actually had a, like a really interesting just as you were getting into bankruptcy law. I mean the bankruptcy code seventy eight came in and you and then you're you're getting into the onto the bench in ninety four. There have been all these seismic changes that happened to bankruptcy as you were beginning your career. And I just wanted to know if you could just talk about some of those changes over time because they have huge impact on us now. Well, and now we're going to start to the heart of things. Um, uh, exit interviews um, are opportunities for uh, someone to give constructive feedback on the workplace uh, for the sake of those who are going to be uh, staying on, uh, and that's really that's really what I'm interested in doing. There's um, on the on the one hand, there have been seismic changes in the economy, but in the bankruptcy code. Um, there, there was a design defect um, in 19, in the in throughout the 70s. There was a lot of work done to um, to try to figure out how the code should be rewritten. There was going to be there was going to be a total rewrite of the bankruptcy laws, and the notion was to make the bankruptcy court a real court with a judge who wasn't. Involved much in, uh, wasn't involved in the administration of, of cases. Uh, my predecessor Harold White 
Uh, he conducted all of the first meetings of creditors through October, through September 30, 1979. Uh, he would appoint the trustees. Well, the, the idea was, no, we're going to change that. We're going to have uh, the judges won't appoint the trustees. They won't be involved in the administration of cases. They will resolve uh, controversies. Uh, and the notion was to, to have the bankruptcy court have the capacity to hear lots of uh, <coughs> complex matters. And the, uh, at, they, were, they wrote the code uh, basically imagining one-stop shop for all controversies. And they envisioned an Article III judge conducting that court. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to Congress. Um, and, and this is just an extraordinary uh, thing to have happened, but Chief Justice Berger went to the primary drafts people and said, keep them Article I judges. Um, and they said, there's this mismatch. We, you know, they have to have Article III powers. Keep them Article I judges. I will get the votes for you uh, when the matter comes before the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, I, you know, this would be libelous, or it would be slander, except go read Geraldine <coughs> Munn's work in the American Bankruptcy Law Journal. Um, she found, you know, she found all the written evidence of this. Uh, in 1982, Justice Berger did try to be true to his word. He wrote the dissent, the three, per, three justice dissent in the Marathon versus Northern Pipeline. Uh, again, extraordinary time because what the court held, the plurality decision held, was uh, that bankruptcy judges couldn't exercise Article Three powers, um, the, and which are just just list for me. Um, we can't decide matters that, that depend on state law, uh, that, where the outcome would be state law. We can't decide. Um, we can't. Uh, we can't decide state law fraudulent conveyance matters. We can't. Um, so, but the. the the justices said, but this is pretty tumultuous, so we will, we will stay our decision for six months so Congress can fix it. And then they <laughs> stayed it for another six months so Congress could fix it. And then they stayed it for another six months. Congress so didn't do anything in, in those years either, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. So in June of 1984, uh, the bankruptcy system, the bankruptcy judges, we. Well, I wasn't a judge then, but the bankruptcy judges were told, uh, we're not sure what you are. Uh, you may be your consultants. You know, may, uh, it, I, I can remember trying to figure out how to deal. You know, we had cases we had to file. We had matters we had to, and basically the bankruptcy courts were at a standstill. Um, it got patched over. Uh, there was a there was a. Uh, an interim rule that was written to deal with this. Uh, and finally, when Congress saw that they weren't going to get any more um, uh, extensions from the justices, they, they put a patch on it, um, which everybody sort of said, mm, how does that really fix the problem? But we, we all engaged in the, in the fiction for a long time, and there were rumblings. Uh, but in 2010, uh, in the, uh, an opinion called Stern v. Marshall, uh, which is uh, the subject of a of a opera in London now, <laughs> because it involved Anna Nicole Smith, um, uh, the Stern issue, the the, the, the uh, the Northern Pipeline issue came back with a vengeance. Uh, although Chief Justice Roberts said, well, this was a very narrow decision, that there was just this one category of cases where 
bankruptcy judges couldn't enter a final judgment. Um, a lot of the circuit courts didn't agree with it being such a narrow decision. And in fact, the Sixth Circuit has said it's a structural problem, the structural problem being that Congress cannot take Article III jurisdiction <coughs> and give it to an Article I court. Structural. Um, this, this June, in a uh, case called Bellingham out of the Ninth Circuit, we are going to learn whether it's structural, structural being, even if the parties want you to hear that case, you can't hear that case. You, can, you, you, can, you can't enter a final judgment with respect to it. You can send a, you can send a recommendation to the district court, but you, and uh, nobody knows how that decision is going to come out. Uh, but uh, the the five people, the five justices uh, who uh, ruled in Stern that. Uh, that there was a problem, um, they're still there. And, uh, and what may happen is that uh, the consent that many court people have said, well, if the parties consent, then the judge should be able to, to go forward. Um, Article three judges are very jealous about conferring jurisdiction through consent. And uh, so come June, um, we could have, we could have uh, Justice Roberts succeed where Justice Berger, uh, Chief Justice Berger didn't, and somehow or another uh, get an opinion that says, no, it's not a big deal. Uh, parties can consent. You know. Or we could have um, a real showstopper. Now, in, in terms of the day-to-day -day work of bankruptcy courts, the show will go on because in the Chapter 7 cases, for the most part, um, they're handled by the trustees. Uh, they involve very little judicial uh, time, if any. But in the cases um, that are needed to keep uh, the cases that come to the judges, it will be a big problem. Um, and uh, it's, it's been an issue for me this, uh, for the last three and a half years in the uh, Ponzi scheme case, Fair Finance, where there were over 150 lawsuits filed. Uh, and in each of those lawsuits, I had, I had to try to figure out, do I have any, can I do anything with this? Uh, Fortunately, uh, District Court Judge Patricia Gahn agreed to take any of the, case, of the lawsuits that had to be tried by a District Court Judge. She agreed to take them onto her docket. Um, and that has created a relatively efficient administration of this case. But there's been, uh, there's, we, we probably put in, <coughs> I want to say we put in uh, at least a quarter of a year of judge time on these issues of, <coughs> on the jurisdictional issues. Um, and the case has been slowed down. The Cassandra and me concern, is concerned that we're going to see uh, a decision in June saying it's structural. Um, and I'm going to turn to the district court judge in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I hope you're getting ready for this. For for uh, uh, don't don't plan any vacations in July. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I hope I hope that they find a way uh, for the sanity of of the district court judges. Um, to say, well, yes, people should be able to consent to have a bankruptcy judge uh, decide this. 
My husband told me this was all inside baseball, and so I should, I, I should move on. But yeah, this is the team. <laughs> this, this is the this is the bullpen here. But uh, yeah. but it it, it, it is. Um, well, could could so so theoretically? I mean, if you if, if, hamstrung as you are by this, and, and just curious about this, if you have parties before you, and somebody doesn't want the case to go on, could you could you theoretically hold up someone's bankruptcy like using this decision? I mean, oh, can, can you can you uh, stop the, the motion? The, the stern decision absolutely favors the person who doesn't want a swift decision, absolutely, um, uh, and. It's been used that way on occasion. <laughs> um, yeah. It, but I, I, I am glad to see that there is going to be some resolution of this one way or the other at the Supreme Court level <coughs> because uh, it, the Sixth Circuit has decided uh, to interpret Stern very broadly. Uh, in circuits like the Second Circuit, it doesn't exist for them. It doesn't exist for them. It really doesn't. Uh, so the uniform bankruptcy code isn't uniform at right. all. <laughs> and, and, and that's a good thing probably because, you know, um, major cases are likely to get filed in, New York, uh, in the Southern District of New York, in part because uh, things can get done there. So. Um, there are other, aside from Stern, um, <laughs> Yeah, there also are some other things Besides that, that uh, Mrs. Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I mean, there are some other changes too that have under that have that you've seen from the bench in bankruptcy over time, and I think that um, uh, even even after you became a judge in in '94, and I just wondered if you could. Well, part of the problem with with uh, trying to have uh, to legislate about economic matters is the economy doesn't stand still. Um, and one of the things that the drafters of the, of the 1978 code were trying to do was to create an environment, that they, they used the word code because uh, they knew there would be changes. They didn't know what changes there would be, but there would be changes. Uh, so they, they wanted to um, have a, a court that had sufficient discretion to interpolate from the code uh, with respect to things that weren't in existence at the time the code was passed. The mismatch, when you didn't have Article um, Three judges, you know, the bankruptcy judges would interpret, but I think that one of the things that happened was that um, as bankruptcy questions would go up to the Supreme Court for interpretation, uh, there was a real, uh, the fact that there were Article Three judges making doing the interpretation in the first instance uh, was a, a significant under the radar factor in some of the decisions where it's like, well, we have to, you know, we have to, we have to just rein these, these Article I judges in. I could be wrong about that. But uh, the, the bankruptcy code, uh, the there have been many decisions dealing with the bankruptcy code, and it's been, it was sort of a laboratory for statutory interpretation. Um, uh, and those decisions have uh, really fueled the notion that if Congress, if, if Congress wanted it to come out that way, Congress knew how to, to say that. Well, um, the bankruptcy code has, there have been amendments to the bankruptcy code uh, in 1984, 1986, 1994, and 2005. Um, until 2005, those had been really, the efforts, the effort had been to, to try to figure out how the changes would affect the economy in general. Um, in, in 1994, legislation was passed that, uh, to appoint a bankruptcy review commission to, 
to gather, to, to go around the country, have hearings, try to figure out what needed to be changed about the bankruptcy code. The uh, credit card industry um, went to the people, went to the commission and said, well, we need a means test. And they said, well, you know, we're not, we're, we're still taking, um, we're still taking testimony. Uh, maybe we do, maybe we don't. They said, we need a means test. Well, that may be in the report, but, uh, and the report was supposed to be delivered to Congress in 1997. In 1996, the credit card industry declared that report dead on arrival and began um, lobbying for its version. Um, they spent $160 million on lobbyists. Uh, they made up, made up uh, facts, like, like what? Like, uh, the losses in bankruptcy uh, that, were, that they were taking um, was costing every American family $400 a year. It was just pulled from the air. Had to be a figure big enough to make people care. Pulled from the air. Um, when people thought, well, we should point out that they're spending more on direct mail campaigns than their losses in bankruptcy, <laughs> fell on deaf ears. Um, and I, you know, now you were just talking about how judges are supposed to be neutral. <laughs> <laughs> this is your accident interview. Have that. That's right. That's right. But this, I mean, uh, th this went on. Uh, this struggle went on for you know. Um, the bankruptcy code had been a pretty neutral document, but in 2005, um, there were a lot of amendments that, and they were not they were not a package of you know. Some of them were you couldn't you couldn't tell what they meant, um, and unfortunately, one of the things that's happened in the jurisprudence since the 2005 code is. When a matter goes up on appeal, um, the uh, and the court's trying to figure out, well, what did Congress mean? And they're scratching their heads, can't figure out. It's just it's the woman who had been the um, uh, majority counsel uh, to uh, the House committee. She begged her boss to let her just you know, let let her just go in and clean up the language. <laughs> She said, "Really, I will, you know, I, I, I will honor the, the spirit to know. You know, we can't change this language. Um, but what? There were, and there was virtually no legislative history. But what courts will do is say, well, you know, it was clear that in 2005, mm -hmm. Congress was trying to rein in debtor abuse and everything. Um, and, and if you can cast this as debtor abuse." Then you get um, you get an interpretation of the statutory language, which um, continues to to make this, the code less and less of a an even playing field uh, manual. So it's 2005. Is that when uh, student debt, student loan debt, came off the table, or was that in an earlier? <coughs> that was in, uh, well. It, in 94, uh, but then um, there was some, you know, there was some tweaking of that um, in the 2005. Uh, but that the inability to uh, discharge student debt has been around since 1994. So. Um, I I just was curious if you. Uh, I mean, it's just so, it's so funny, like the credit card industry uh, then is the same as now, you know, with the credit card changes. Well, what, if it, well, put yeah, to no. that. The credit card uh, companies actually uh, ended up sucking the exhaust uh, of the uh, car lenders. <laughs> but we won't, they, 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 they came out, they came out uh, in some ways with a lower priority than uh, uh, car dealers, um, or, or car, uh, car financers. Well, although, you know, can you just talk a little bit, and I, and I don't want to drag us too too far off the field, but, but I'm really interested in the idea that there are people 
<laughs> this is another one of those strange industries, you know, that, that purchase claims, purchase uh, bankruptcy claims as they go into court. You can be an investor and go in and say, and, and buy up somebody's stake in the case and be a player in the case. And I just would like you to just talk a little bit about. Well, that starts that started in chapter 11. People, uh, because in chapter 11, sometimes it'll take a while for the case to. So uh, investors would uh, go and say, well, I'll buy your claim in the Wheeling Pit case for you know five cents on the dollar. Um, and then they're hoping that in a few years there'll be a case as a Wheeling Pit paid 70, a 70% 70 dividend on unsecured claims. Um, but what's happened then uh, with, uh, is that claims buying has come into uh, the consumer area. And, and uh, portfolios of uh, consumer debt are sold. I mean, it used to be that you know, uh, a bank was, they, banks would write off loans. And they'd just write them off, and but then they found out. Well, no, they could get a, you know they could get a penny or two on the dollar, or maybe they could get a half cent on the dollar um, for these. So they so they started selling them, and um, you uh, the irony is that some of those cases, some of those claims, it was not worth pursuing them in small claims court because you'd have to pay a filing right. fee. You'd have to pay a filing fee. Plus, you had to have documentation. You had to have the, and when th these claims are sold, um, they're not sold with the underlying documentation. They're sold with one line of data. Um, one of the happy things is that uh, just a few months ago, um, there were changes, uh, people who are, filing claims in bankruptcy uh, that they didn't, that didn't originate with them are now required to pay a, 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 a fee. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how, whether that has any impact on the, um, on the claims buyers. What really blew my mind was when I learned that you can buy portfolios of claims that have been discharged in bankruptcy. And there are, peop there are people who buy <coughs> claims that are discharged in bankruptcy, and they hire, you know, they hire people to uh, call these folks, and uh, here we have um, another, I think, happy development. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is looking into this now. Very useful. Um, but I think I've, I've really strayed. Well, yeah, you probably did, but I, I probably got us <laughs> on track a little bit. But I'm really interested in that in that idea. So as a judge, I'm just, just let me ask one little tiny question about that too. So as a judge, okay, uh, someone comes in, they bought up these claims, they have one line of data uh, that they've purchased to show their total on that claim. But really, as a bankruptcy judge, I mean, you've, you've said to parties in bankruptcy cases, I, I want you to bring, you have to show me that you've got skin in the game. Show me what your, the ownership of this debt is. I mean, you've said that to, uh, to parties that came before you in court, right? Uh, to to um, Countrywide, well. for example. I mean, they're not a debt buyer. <laughs> they're not a claim buyer. But, but I mean, you could, do, could you do that then with a claim buyer who's a one-off? Like that in a case. Well, one of the things that's happening now is that the, the bankruptcy rules are being rewritten to require um, uh, documentation of the underlying mm -hmm. claim. So if a claims buyer doesn't have the documentation, um, uh, their claims hopefully will be objected to. And, and but there will be, the, the thing is that we could, you know, the, the bankruptcy rules can be written. Uh, pretty soon somebody's going to figure a way around them. Or they're just going to bold. I mean, I, I believe that, that if you sell, if, if you have a discharge debt and you sell it to someone, that's an act to collect. It's a violation of the, of the uh, uh, post-discharge injunction. Uh, and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, too. I mean, it sounds like that. Yeah. But, uh, but the thing is, the thing is that 
getting lawyers for the people to whom this is you know, people to whom this is happening. They don't have the ability. They don't, they don't have the ability to pay a lawyer to pursue it. Um, and uh, and they just take their chances. You know, I mean, their, their risk analysis is catch me if you can. And there's no real thing that it requires a, someone to pay the lawyer's fees for someone who. Well, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So, but. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Well, let's um, well let's just talk a little bit because I know that um, someone had requested before we we came that uh, that you talk a little bit about managing really complex cases in bankruptcy court and some of them really are these you know octopus cases fair finance is just one but a, a lot of bankruptcy cases they're just not that clean to begin yeah. with well i think i mean one of the, the the really complex cases are likely to be the chapter 11 cases and um you you'd ask me you'd ask me well how do you how do you write the plan it's like no i don't write the plan um what uh, one of the things that has been a real success uh, on some levels in the 78 Act is Chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11 creates a forum like for people to come and talk about their problems. Uh, the people who are owed debt, the people, the unsecured creditors, the, the secured creditors, the debtor, sometimes the buyers. And what the judge can do is to organize, to keep those people organized. Um, we're, not, we're not gonna write the plan. Um, uh, if somebody objects and says the plan doesn't do, doesn't comply with the code, we'll determine whether it does or doesn't. But really what, uh, I once heard somebody Talk, talk about uh, the bankruptcy judge in Wheeling Pitt as being like a, a traffic cop, <laughs> you know, sort of, you know, trying to keep keep uh, ideas flowing, keep people focused, um, and what you do is you try to be patient enough for the people to talk and see whether they can come to an agreement, whether they can find um, an economically something that's in their mutual economic interest. That's, when people are in bankruptcy, either as debtors or as creditors, they, uh, everybody's lost. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out how to uh, find a mutual solution to use the assets that are still there um, to generate value. Uh, and bankruptcy, best bankruptcy lawyers can be very creative. Um, but if the judge uh, just sort of trusts them to keep things moving along, lots of them will go into a bunker. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what you want to do. You want to keep people from going into the bunker, and you want to, and you want to, um, you want to make sure that they have a viable exit strategy. Some, some people, some entities file uh, bankruptcy, Chapter 11, um, and they haven't, the, they haven't the foggiest idea of how they might get out. Um, and so, if there if there are valuable assets there, you don't want to see them diminish in value. Um, every Chapter 11 is its own strange and wonderful, or not so wonderful, <laughs> concoction. Uh, what, what I view my role as is to try to keep the value from diminishing and try to get, um, if, there's a, if there's a going concern there uh, with, with jobs, um, that might be saved uh, to get to the point where those assets can, if either there's going to be a plan of reorganization or if there's not, then as happens in the great percentage of Chapter 11s now, a sale of the assets is a going concern, um, which saves jobs um, and does get 
value to creditors. Uh, I, I, there was a, a very interesting case where um, it was a series of, of nursing homes uh, and they filed uh, and really they didn't have a clue of how they were going to get out. But the, the creditors committee council came in and just took control um, and was able uh, to get the secured creditors paid in full and get about a 50% dividend to unsecured creditors. And um, of course, with, with nursing homes, you've got to be very concerned about the patients. Um, uh, but he did that in about an eight month period. Um, How, how is that, like eight months, is that fast, bankruptcy time? Is that bankruptcy time, chapter 11 bankruptcy time, that's quite fast. <laughs> Especially if you come in without a clue of how uh, you would, uh, you weren't there uh, to file the petition. When you come in as, as counsel to the creditors committee, you have to learn everything from the ground up. And that case, um, I, I, I'm still in awe of, of the, organizational abilities of, of that council, but. You know, um, I, I told you that this was gonna go really, really, really fast. This would seem fast at the end, but I, I, I just want, it, I think we're kind of running out of time here, but I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you said, you know, Judge Batisti said, follow your passions and taught you that you can do that as a lawyer. And you know, there are a bunch of law school students here and uh, young lawyers, and I just wanted to say, like, what what's your best pitch to, to them? Like, why why bankruptcy? Why bankruptcy law of any other kind? Well, it's 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 not for everybody. <laughs> uh, if you're going to do consumer bankruptcy work, you better be really well organized. Uh, uh, but if when I when I stumbled on bankruptcy um, and it was really stumbling onto it. Uh, I wanted to be I, I, I wanted to be a generalist, and one of the things about bankruptcy is that you are a generalist because um, whether you're dealing with um, a wage earner filing a, uh, a Chapter Seven, or whether you're dealing with um, LTV, you've got to figure out what all of their legal and financial issues are. Um, and it's also about problem solving. But that, that for me, that was the hook. For me, uh, sometimes you solve the problems by going and litigating and getting a decision. And sometimes um, you solve the matter because could all sit down and sort through the issues. But it creates a structure uh, for, for sorting through problems. Um, and whether it's somebody who hasn't paid their taxes for 10 years, um, or whether it's somebody who uh, uh, his wife filed for him for bankruptcy, and he, he didn't know. <laughs> Marilyn had a case where a truck driver got filed for bankruptcy, and it was his wife who did it on the sly because she got credit cards in someone else's name. Uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was somebody who got, came in and said, I filed a motion to dismiss the case, uh, said it wasn't his case. I said, well, why do you expect me to believe that? He goes, well, let me put it this way. I thought I was her first husband. I was her sixth husband, <laughs> and I, I, I really, I was just about ready to break into, I'm Henry the Eighth, I am Henry the Eighth, I am my, uh, on the bench. <laughs> um, it, 
bankruptcy is about people. That's really, uh, bankruptcy is about um, uh, if, if there's any old Henry in you, uh, there are uh, there are ninety thousand stories in that docket, <laughs> and uh, and I've, I've felt enormously lucky to be able to, to serve in that capacity. Um, so. Well, I we're we're like running up to the end, and I think that. Um, that Judge Shea Stoneham has, has said that she would rather, I think, take questions just one on one afterwards. So uh, I, I don't know. Can can we just go hit the reception and do questions there? Does that? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.